The Roman Empire, of whose growth we are going to read, began, like many other great things, in a very small way. It grew up from a tiny settlement made upon one of the seven hills which lie around the river Tiber, about eighteen miles from its mouth, and this settlement was made by a little band of shepherds who had probably been drawn to the spot by the advantages offered by the river for the watering and the grassy hill for the feeding of their flocks. After a while, as they saw that their high position would give them an advantage over the fierce tribes who surrounded the district, they spread themselves over the other hills and began to guard the mouth of the river and use it for purposes of trade. Then, little by little, they conquered, first, their warlike neighbors, then the whole of Italy, and gradually extended their power far and wide until, in the course of eight hundred years, they had built up the greatest empire which the ancient world that is, the world before the birth of Christ, ever knew. Now about three hundred and fifty years after the founding of the city, Rome was burned by the Gauls, and with it were destroyed most of the old tablets and records which told the story of the city in its early days. But the Roman people, who were justly proud of what their forefathers had done, were very anxious that this early history should not be forgotten, although they had no longer any written accounts of it. So they put together the descriptions which their fathers had given them of the glories of those past days, and as a story seldom loses anything in the telling, the result soon became a legend. Now a legend is a story which is founded on fact, but the events which it describes either did not all take place or did not happen exactly in the way they are there described. Sometimes they were put together by poets, whose imagination would naturally lead them to decorate the story by inserting a little here or exaggerating something, there. But even those history writers who were not poets were quite content to tell these legends as though they were real history, for they naturally wanted to make the Roman people as important as possible in the eyes of all other nations. This accounts, therefore, for the legends of the founding of the city, for the Romans did not care to trace their descent from a few poor shepherds, keeping their flocks upon the hillsides. They preferred to think that their first rulers were descended from the gods themselves. Most civilized people who lived about the time these legends were made had heard of the story of the Trojan War, and so, in their account of the beginnings of Rome, they said that Aeneas, the Trojan hero, fleeing from burning Troy, after many years of wanderings by sea and by land, had settled down in Latium, the district of which Rome, in after days, became the chief city. There he is said to have married the daughter of Latinus, its king, and to have set up a new kingdom, which his son Ascanius established more firmly at Alba Longa, at the foot of the Alban Mount. The descendants of Ascanius were all kings of Alba, until at length the kingdom fell into the hands of Numata. He was a just and gentle king, but his wicked brother Amulius, in jealousy of his position, drove him from the throne and shut up his daughter in a temple, that none of the descendants of Numata might take from him his crown. Soon after this he heard, to his dismay, that twin boys, of whom the god Mars was said to be the father, had been born to the princess. They were immediately taken from her, and by the orders of Amulius were thrown into the river Tiber. Now it happened that the river was in flood at the time, so that the servants who were carrying out the king's commands could not get to the main stream. They, therefore, put the rough trough, on which the boys were laid, in the deepest pool they could find, and went their way. But, so says the legend, the water ebbed away, and the babes were left high and dry on land. Attracted by their cries a she-wolf, which had come down to drink, approached them and suckled them as gently as if they had been her own cubs. She was found in the act of licking them affectionately by the master of the royal herd, who carried them home to his wife. The boys, whom he called Romulus and Remus, grew up in the stables or on the hillsides and soon became as strong and daring as the wild beasts, whose dens they stormed. Gradually they gathered about them a band of young shepherds from the country around, and with these at their back they became a terror to the robber bands who dwelt in the hills and woods of the district. One day, certain of these robbers, enraged at the loss of some booty, seized upon Remus and, dragging him before King Amulius, accused him of making raids upon the lands of Numata, which were close to those of his usurping brother. Amulius therefore sent Remus to Numata to be punished, but the latter, puzzled by the lad's royal heir and still more by the news that he had a twin brother and that they were exactly the age his drowned grandsons would have been, kept him unharmed within his house, 
while he made inquiries as to who he really was. Meantime, Romulus had learned from the master of the royal herd, who had long guessed the truth, the whole secret of his birth and origin, and he now proceeded with a trusty band of herdsmen against the palace of the wicked Amulius. There he was joined by Remus, whose escape had been easily managed, and together the lads killed the usurper and hastened to put their grandfather once more upon the throne of Alba. But this did not satisfy their energetic souls. They were seized with the desire to found a city in that region where they had been brought up. So they took with them their band of shepherds and set out for the seven hills lower down the course of the river. The difficulty now arose as to who should give his name to the new city, and who should rule over it when it was founded. So, as the gods were supposed to arrange all such things by giving a sign to mortals, Romulus took up his station on the Palatine, Remus on the Aventine Hill, and awaited the sign, or augury. Unfortunately, it came in such a form that both could claim it. Remus was the first to see six vultures fly across the hill, but, just as he made this known, Romulus saw twelve. One band of followers claimed Remus, the other Romulus as their king, and during the noise and confusion the brothers met in such angry dispute that blows were struck on both sides, and Remus fell, smitten by the hand of one of the followers of Romulus. Another form of this legend says that Romulus succeeded in establishing his right and began to build the walls of the city, whereupon Remus mocked him by jumping backward and forwards over them, until his brother's wrath was roused, and he slew him with the words, so perish whosoever shall leap over my walls. Remus, at any rate, was slain, and Romulus became the founder of the new city, which probably took its name, Rome, from him. So runs the legend of the founding of the city. There is certainly this amount of truth in it. The first settlers were shepherds, who knew how to hold the sword as well as the crook. They must have had a leader, whose name may or may not have been Romulus. They chose the Palatine Hill as being the most convenient for their flocks, and all this, as we have seen, is faithfully told us in the legend. The legends do not describe exactly how the city of Rome was first built, but from what we know of the early story of other Italian cities we can tell very nearly all that happened. A hole was dug in the ground on the Palatine Hill, offerings of fruit and corn were placed within it as a gift to the gods, and the stone laid upon it became the hearth of the central house of the new city. Then, the founder, having thrown one end of his toga, or cloak, over his head, marked out the line of the boundary walls with a plough drawn by a white ox and a white cow. And, where the future gates were to be, he raised the plough share, so that no trench was made at those points. This, the legend tells us, was first done by Romulus, who afterward extended the city in order to take in six other villages on the neighbouring hills, so that all seven were gradually included within the boundary walls. The difficulty now was to get enough people to come and live there, and to defend it against the attacks of hostile neighbours. To meet this demand, Romulus is said to have made in the city what was known as a refuge, a place where all who wanted a change, whether freemen or slaves, might meet together on equal terms, since no questions were asked about their former life. But though this brought many men to the new city, there were as yet no women within the walls. So Romulus sent messengers to the neighboring tribes, asking that their daughters and sisters might be given in marriage to the new inhabitants of Rome, but everywhere they went they were driven out with insult and reproach. The founder of the city determined to get hold of these maidens by force. He proceeded to hold a great show of games at Rome to which he invited all the tribes of the surrounding district. Among them came the whole population of the Sabines, as well as many others from Latium. The guests were much interested in the growth of the new city, and, when the games had begun, became absorbed in, watching them. Suddenly, on the signal being given, the Roman youths rushed into their midst and carried off all their unmarried women to their own homes. The show was broken up in terror, and the parents of the maidens fled to their own borders, breathing vengeance upon their crafty hosts. Romulus soon managed to pacify the women, but meantime their fathers and brothers were preparing, under the leadership of the Sabine king, to avenge their loss on Rome. Some of them, indeed, would not wait for the Sabines to act and themselves attack the city. These were easily beaten by Romulus, and, while their lands were thus added to those of the Romans, many of them, by their own wish, 
came to live within the city walls. Thus the population grew still more. Meantime, the Sabines had prepared a powerful force and advanced upon Rome. The story goes that the Sabine king persuaded the daughter of Tarpeius, the officer in charge of the Roman citadel, to admit them within its walls, promising to give her what his followers wore on their left hands. She hoped for the golden armlets and rings set with precious jewels that they generally wore, but, when they were admitted, they cast upon her the shields they carried on their left arms, and killed her beneath their weight. Thus the Sabines got possession of the citadel, and in the battle that followed it looked as though the Romans would have been defeated. But just at the critical moment, when spears and darts were flying fast, the Sabine women who had married Romans rushed among the combatants, beseeching on one side their fathers, on the other their husbands, not to make them orphans or widows on that ill-fated day. This appeal brought the armies to a standstill. Both sides laid down their arms, and before long a treaty was made by which the Sabine kingdom was joined on equal terms to that of Rome, and the two kings ruled together over the united people, until the death of the Sabine left Romulus supreme over all. Many of the tribes of the neighboring cities of Latium felt the might of the founders' warlike arm and were subdued or joined to Rome by treaties of alliance. At last, one day when, as the legend goes on to tell, he was reviewing his troops, a great thunderstorm suddenly arose, in the midst of which Romulus vanished from the earth. When the people of Rome were troubled as to what should be their future fate without him for their leader, one of the chief men came forward with the story that he had met the father of the city at early dawn, and that Romulus had said to him, Go, tell the Romans that the powers of heaven so will it that my Rome shall be the capital of the world. Let them, therefore, cultivate the art of war, and let them know that no human power can resist the Roman arms. With these words, he is said to have vanished into the sky. We see quite clearly from this legend that the first chieftain of the little Roman settlement was a man of war, who managed to get the upper hand among the neighboring tribes of shepherds during his period of rule. One of the tribes at least, that of the Sabines, evidently joined the Roman settlers on friendly terms and proceeded to grow up with them. The legend goes on to speak of seven kings of Rome, of whom Romulus was the first, but, as far as we can tell, these kings were chieftains, sometimes chosen by the people, sometimes strong enough to make themselves rulers in their own way, and each one seems to represent some special kind of growth in the Roman city. The position they held was of great importance, for they were at the same time the lawgivers, the high priests, and the chief magistrates of the people. The people themselves were divided into two great classes, the patricians, or the nobility, who were the fathers of the city, the first settlers with their descendants, and the plebeians, who, in somewhat later days, fled to the city for protection or settled there for trade purposes, and so became the middle and lower classes of the Roman people. At the death of Romulus, there were said to be a hundred patricians in Rome, and these for a time ruled over it in parties of ten at a time. With this arrangement, the people were so discontented that a just and gentle Sabine chieftain named Numa Pompilius was made king. He was very learned as well as very religious, and all his interests lay in the keeping of peace, instead of making war upon his neighbors. He it was who built the Temple of Janus in Rome, which was always kept open in time of war and shut in time of peace. This temple was closed throughout his reign, so that he had plenty of time to improve the social and religious condition of the people. The legend tells that he was the first to divide the year into twelve months with thirty days in each. He also arranged all religious matters, with a regular band of priests to instruct the people in their duties towards the many gods and goddesses whom they worshipped. Most of these gods and goddesses represented the things with which the Romans were most familiar in their everyday life. Thus Flora was the goddess of flowers, and Saturn the god of seed sowing, Sears was the goddess of corn, and Bacchus the god of wine. Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, ruled over the olive groves, and Apollo, the sun god, was worshipped side by side with his sister Diana, goddess of the moon. Near the hearth of every home stood an altar where the Penates, or special gods of the family, were worshipped, and another to the Lares, or spirits of the dead. Every fire upon the hearthstone was lighted in honour of these household gods, so that the people were constantly reminded of their presence. 
No undertaking of any importance was ever begun without prayers and sacrifices to the gods, or without taking the omens as to whether it would end in failure or success. We have seen how Romulus and Remus did this. A still more usual way was to open a collection of verses called the Sibylline Books at Haphazard, and to act according to what was read on the first page on which the eye happened to fall, or to kill a bird or animal and to judge of the result of the undertaking by the appearance of the entrails. For instance, when years later Julius Caesar took an omen as to whether he should go to the Forum on the Ides of March, the wise men brought answer back that they could not find a heart within the animal they had killed, which would have prevented any less courageous man from going outdoors that day. All these matters were arranged and established by Numa, according to the legend. When Numa died, the Romans, who were tired of peace, chose as king the warlike Tullus Hostilius, who at once attacked the rival state of Alba Longa, the head of the Latin League. This league was an alliance made between all the cities of Latium, and, of these, Rome was eager to be the chief in place of Alba. Now at this time, by far the most powerful nation of Italy was that of the Etruscans, many of whose cities were strong enough to threaten the towns of Latium with instant capture. When he realized this, Metius, the Alban leader, having led out his forces against those of the invading Tullus, reminded the latter that the Etruscans would only wait for them to begin to fight, in order to come down and crush both conqueror and conquered. Let us, therefore, said he, decide in some way, without much bloodshed on the part of each people, which of the two shall rule the other. It so happened that there were in the opposing armies two sets of brothers, exactly equal both in age and strength. The Alban brothers were called the Curiatii, and the Romans, the Horatii, and it was arranged that they should fight with the sword, each for his own country, and that side with whom lay the victory should rule over the other. So an open space was made between the armies, and the three Horatii advanced to meet the three Curiatii. The signal was given, and both armies held their breath in suspense as the young men closed in fight. Then a shout of joy rose up from the Alban side as two of the Romans fell one upon the other in death, while all three of the Curiatii were only wounded. These three now threw themselves upon Horatius, and at first it seemed as if he had no chance against them. But, being quite unhurt, he pretended to run away, thinking that they, weary and bleeding from their wounds, would follow him at long intervals. This is exactly what occurred. Looking back he saw one of his foes not far behind him, and at once rushed back and killed, him. The Albans shouted to the third to go to the aid of the second, but, before he could come up with him, he was already slain. The third, spent with wounds and running, fell an easy prey, and Horatius was left victor on the field. The dismayed Albans at once put themselves under the command of Tullus, who bade Metius keep his men under arms in case he needed their help against the Etruscans and then turned back towards Rome. The victorious Horatius marched in front of the army, bearing the armour of the three slain foes, but, when he was about to enter the city, a terrible thing happened. His sister, who was betrothed to one of the dead Curiatii, coming out to meet her betrothed, recognised her lover's military cloak upon his shoulders, and at once began to lament and to call upon his name with many tears. The fury of the triumphant Horatius was roused when he found that she thought of her own private grief in the midst of public rejoicing. Drawing his sword, he stabbed the maiden to the heart, saying, So let every Roman woman depart who shall mourn for an enemy. The Romans were divided between admiration for the service he had done them on the battlefield and horror at this act of cruelty. Justice must be done, however, and Horatius was found guilty of murder and condemned to be hanged upon a barren tree outside the bounds of the city. By the king's advice he appealed to the people, that is, he made them his judges as to whether this sentence was to be carried out. The Romans were much moved by the words of the aged father of Horatius, who reminded them of the glorious deeds he had so lately done, and who declared, moreover, that his daughter had been justly slain. They decreed that their hero was to go free of punishment, but his father set up a little beam across the road and made his son go under it with covered head as though beneath the yoke. This remained for many a long day, under the name of the sister's beam, and the whole story illustrates the ancient and important custom of granting an appeal to the people against the sentence of a magistrate. Meantime, the Albans, 
still furious at their subjection to Rome, were called out by Tullus to help him against the people of a neighboring city which had revolted against him. But the treacherous Metius betrayed his trust and called off his men at the most critical point of the battle. With the utmost difficulty, Tullus managed to win the day and then took a terrible revenge on his faithless allies. Metius was bound to two chariots and torn to pieces by forcing in opposite directions the horses yoked to them, the whole population of Alba was transplanted to Rome, and the city was almost entirely destroyed. When Tullus, after making Rome the chief city in Latium, was struck dead by a thunderbolt, Ancus Martius was chosen king. He was the grandson of Numa the Peaceful, and the Latins, thinking he would follow in the steps of his grandfather, at once seized the opportunity to invade the Roman territory. But Ancus combined the courage and daring of Tullus with the wisdom of Numa. He conquered several of the Latin cities and received their inhabitants as Roman citizens, and then, realizing that Rome must grow in size and strength if she would keep her high position, he set to work to build. The first bridge over the Tiber was built by him, a great trench was made around the Aventine Hill, a prison was erected for the terror of evildoers, and, chief of all, the seaport of Ostia was founded at the mouth of the Tiber, where a flourishing trade was begun with other countries. Evidently, his reign marks a period of conquest and defense, and also the beginnings of commerce for Rome. The legend which tells of the fifth king of Rome shows that in some way the influence of the Etruscans had made itself felt in the city. A certain rich Etruscan lord, named Tarquin, left the city of his birth and migrated with his wife to Rome. As, they drove into the city an eagle, swooping gently down with outspread wings, carried off his felt cap. It fluttered overhead for a while, and then, replacing it upon his brow, sailed away into the sky. His wife at once declared that this was a happy omen and meant that the gods were about to place a crown upon her husband's head. Full of hopes and ambitions, they made themselves a home within the town, and soon the report of Tarquin, and of his generosity and kindness, was carried to the king, who made him guardian of his children. Tarquin soon won the hearts of the Roman people so completely that, when Ancus died, he easily persuaded them to make him king, instead of the young princes. He did much to increase the welfare of Rome, and in his time, says the legend, the valleys between the seven hills were drained by sewers, one of which was so large that a cart loaded with hay could be driven up it. He also marked out the circus, or race course, from which the citizens could watch the games, which took place regularly every year. Tarquin and his wife had two sons of their own, but one day, as the queen was entering the palace, she saw asleep upon the steps a little slave boy, whose head suddenly appeared to have been set on fire. A servant was about to throw water over him, when the queen prevented her and waited quietly for the child to wake of his own accord. When he opened his eyes, the mysterious fire vanished. Then the queen told her husband what she had seen, and bade him bring up the boy as his own son, saying, This child will hereafter be a light to our fortunes when they are doubtful and a defense to our palace when in distress. So the boy, whose name was Servius Tullius, grew up in the palace like a royal prince and was held in such love and honor by all the people that it was clear whom they would wish to have for king after Tarquin was dead. Now when the two sons of Ancus saw this, they were very angry, for they hoped to have won the crown for themselves when Tarquin was no more. So they made a plot to kill the king and to take his place by force. Two shepherds of evil character were sent by them to the palace, where they pretended to have a quarrel and to call upon the king to decide between them. They were brought before him and, while he was giving all his attention to the one who spoke first, the other struck him down with his axe. Then both rushed away from the palace. But before the sons of Ancus could go further in their scheme, the queen had saved the throne for Servius. Although her husband was killed almost at once by the blow he had received, she pretended that he was only slightly hurt and that meantime he wished Servius Tullius to act for him in every way. Not until the new king was thus firmly established in the city did the Romans discover that Tarquin was already dead. Servius made some notable reforms. First, he arranged all the people in certain classes, according to their incomes, for purposes of taxation and warfare. Next, when he found that the population had outgrown the limits of the old city, he built a wall about five miles around, 
enclosing all the seven hills, and thus greatly enlarged the boundaries of Rome. Lastly, by persuading all the chief of the Latin cities to join the Romans in building a temple to Diana at Rome, he made it clear that that city was the head of the Latin League. In order that there might be no dispute about the succession to the throne, Servius had married his two daughters to the sons of Tarquin, who bore their father's name. One of these women was proud and fierce, the other was gentle and meek. The characters of the two princes were just as unlike, so the king hoped to make things right by marrying the fierce Tullia to the gentle Tarquin, and her meek sister to the high-spirited prince. This did not answer at all, for these fierce souls slew, one her husband, the other his wife, and then mated with one another. Then, they determined to seize the throne during the lifetime of the king. Hastening to the senate house, Tarquin the Proud seated himself on the royal throne at its entrance, and when King Servius advanced and asked him how he dared to do this thing, he answered him with fierce words, reproached him with being the son of a slave, and ended by hurling him down the steep flight of steps. The poor old man tried to stagger home, but on his way he was killed by the servants of the wicked Tarquin. His body was left on the public road, and over it drove that same day the chariot of Tullia, his daughter. So that that road was called the accursed way from that time. Tarquin the Proud, though he did much to beautify Rome with the temples he built and to increase her glory by his conquests of the Latin tribes, never succeeded in winning the hearts of his people. They hated both him and his son for their selfishness and tyranny, and when the latter threatened Lucretia, the good and virtuous wife of a Roman noble, with such cruelty that she preferred to kill herself rather than fall into his hands, they would no longer have Tarquin for their king. One of those who saw Lucretia die was a grim and silent man named Brutus, the nephew of the king. A short time before, he with the two sons of Tarquin had visited the temple of Apollo, at Delphi, in Greece, to consult the oracle as to who should have the chief power in Rome. This oracle was supposed to be the voice of the god, speaking through the lips of a priestess who sat within the temple on a tripod, or three-legged stool, and answered the questions put to Apollo. Her answer on this occasion was as follows, He who shall first kiss his mother shall be the chief man in Rome. On hearing this, the three men hastened back to Italy, but just as Brutus was landing he stumbled, and in his fall kissed Mother Earth, and so fulfilled the conditions spoken by the oracle. He it was who now took the lead in, driving out the Tarquins. Passing the knife, red with Lucretia's blood, from hand to hand, he made the citizens swear a solemn oath never again to call any man their king. Tarquin and his son were driven from the city, and the legendary period of royal power came to an end. During the time of these seven kings, Rome had grown up from a tiny settlement of shepherds to a large, well-ordered, and strongly fortified city, containing some fine buildings and engaged in commerce with foreign powers from its harbour town of Ostia. The next step was to extend her sway over other parts of Italy, for, so far, except for a few Latin colonies, her power was limited to the space included by her own four walls.